two, one, two. One, two, one, two, one, two.
Good morning. The Judiciary Committee will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time, and we welcome everyone to today's hearing on Drones and the War on Terror. When can the U.S. target alleged American terrorists overseas? I'll recognize myself first for an opening statement. On February 4, 2013, a confidential Justice Department white paper outlining the legal justification for targeted killings of U.S. citizens overseas was leaked to NBC News. The leak of this white paper brought renewed attention to an issue largely ignored during President Obama's tenure. Is the targeted killing of alleged American terrorists appropriate and under what circumstances? The White Paper also confirms a palpable shift in war on terror policy by this President. In 2007, Barack Obama, the then junior senator from Illinois, laid out his position on the war on terror. Quote, to build a better, freer world, we must first behave in ways that reflect the decency and aspirations of the American people. This means ending the practices of shipping away prisoners in the dead of night to be tortured in far off countries, of detaining thousands without charge or trial, of maintaining a network of secret prisons to jail people beyond the reach of the law. The same president who opposes the detention of foreign terrorists, who opposes the use of enhanced inter interrogation techniques on foreign terrorists, and who attempted to bring foreign terrorists to trial in New York City, is now personally approving the killing of Americans. Ironically, the detention facility in Guantanamo remains open and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and his co-conspirators are being tried before a military commission. Following the release of the White Paper, a bipartisan group of committee members requested the opportunity to review the memos that form the basis of the White Paper. Our request was denied. One of President Obama's first acts as president was to release the Bush Justice Department's Enhanced Interrogation Techniques memos to the public but he now refuses to provide his Justice Department's targeted killing memos, not just to the public, but even to congressional overseers. We also invited the Justice Department to testify today. That request was denied, too. According to at least one estimate, drone strikes against suspected al-Qaeda terrorists have increased sixfold under the Obama administration. Anywhere from 2,500 to 4,000 people have been killed by these strikes. What's more, this administration is not just targeting foreign fighters, but American citizens as well. President Obama ordered the killing of Anwar al-Awlaki, the American-born al-Qaeda cleric. In September of last year, U.S. forces killed al-Awlaki and his 16-year-old son in a drone strike in Yemen. America now knows the criteria used to nominate an American for targeted killing. The White Paper sets forth a legal framework for when the U.S. government can use lethal force against a U.S. citizen who is a senior operational leader of al-Qaeda or an associated force and is located in a foreign country outside the area of active hostilities. The Justice Department claims that in such a case, lethal force would be lawful where three conditions are met. An informed high-level official of the U.S. government has determined that the targeted individual poses an imminent threat of violent attack against the United States. Two, capture is infeasible, and the United States continues to monitor whether capture becomes feasible. Three, the operation would be conducted in a manner consistent with principles of the laws of war. Today's hearing will examine the Justice Department's white paper and the constitutional issues surrounding the targeted killing of Americans overseas. We have assembled an impressive panel of experts to help the committee analyze these important issues. Let me ask uh, members of the staff to locate where that construction work is going on and ask them to uh, allow us to conduct the hearing without uh, the pain of drilling. <coughs> the targeted killing of Americans overseas has ignited a debate about the breadth of a president's commander-in-chief authority and the standard that should apply when targeting Americans. Is the White Paper a fair reading of the law? Under what circumstances can the President decide to kill an American citizen? Is there any due process of law that must be granted before the Commander-in-Chief can kill an American? Does the Administration's approach comport with the law? Should the President be able to decide unilaterally to kill Americans? 
The American people deserve to know and understand the legal basis under which the Obama administration believes it can kill U.S. citizens and under what circumstances. Obviously, were the Justice Department memos made available or the Justice Department here to testify today, members of the committee could have a fuller understanding of the administration's legal rationale. However, today's hearing will provide an initial public debate of the issues. And now it's my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Goodlatte, and uh, members of the committee and our distinguished witnesses present. Uh, <clears throat> we are here examining a pressing matter, namely the use of unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, to strike at suspected terrorists abroad. <clears throat> First, uh, let's make clear the House Judiciary's jurisdiction over the matter. Uh, these are serious constitutional considerations involved, and that's what this committee has been created for as well as civil rights questions, which are also involved uh, in this operation. Uh, our committee has direct oversight of the Department of Justice, which has issued legal opinions, although classified, that purport to establish the legal basis for the use of le lethal force against terrorist suspects. Now, in the course of, uh, of this issue that has been raised, uh, numerous letters have been sent. And I want to uh, point out that our latest one that was joined in with myself, Chairman Goodlatte, former Chairman Jim Sensenbrenner, Trent Franks, Jerry Nadler and Bobby Scott, who wrote again uh, to the president to renew our request for all legal opinions related to drone programs. I am pleased uh, that we reached a clear uh, bipartisan consensus on this issue. This committee requires those documents to fulfill its oversight responsibilities. This isn't a witch hunt. Uh, this is an inquiry. And uh, we're all cleared for top secret. Uh, and we'll work together to convince the administration uh, to satisfy our requests. Uh, let's examine a couple issues here. Targeted strikes against United States citizens. Targeted strikes generally. And three, the odious so-called signature strikes. Uh, now, the, the need for oversight is clear. Uh, I'm not convinced, and the title of the hearing before us suggests, uh, by the administration's legal rationale for the targeted killing of any United States citizen overseas. The white paper describes a balancing test for the Fourth Amendment, unlawful seizure of a person uh, or a life. The Fifth Amendment, due process, uh, which uh, tilted so far in favor of government interest that a potential target appears to have little chance at meaningful due process when he is nominated to without his consent, of course, to the so-called kill list. 
I also remain unconvinced about the targeted killing of terrorist suspects who are non-citizens. Although the administration appears to rest its claim of authority uh, on the authorization for use of military force passed by the Congress in 2001, it is not clear that Congress intended to sanction legal force against a loosely defined enemy in an indefinite conflict with no uh, borders or discernible end date. And I'm considerably troubled by the widely, uh, widely reported use of so-called signature strikes, where suspects need only display suspicious activity, but their identities are unknown prior to the government's use of lethal force against them. That may be a CIA activity that should be sent over to the Defense Department, by the way. To date, uh, and I rush to a conclusion, uh, we uh, uh, want to accomplish the, uh, the, the following. Uh, we need to know more, and I hope that the way that we conduct this hearing individually among our members of the committee will convince the administration uh, that this is not a, a personal nor political, and that all we are seeking is uh, information to which we're duly entitled and uh, we, we have one committee on intelligence that have gotten two reports out of uh, a dozen or more. Uh, that's, that, is, that is not acceptable. And with all due respect uh, to an administration uh, that I support, uh, uh, we are creating a resentment on a visceral level, as General Stanley McChrystal has echoed, on a level uh, uh, that we can't even begin to imagine. McChrystal was the architect of counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, and the resentment created by the American use of unmanned strikes is much greater than the average American appreciates. Well, I think we appreciate it, and I think that we want to uh, have this become the first of, of uh, a number of hearings. I uh, conclude by saying I don't think that the Attorney General of the United States can decline uh, to come before this committee uh, on a subject that is so clearly within our jurisdiction, Mr. Chairman. And I yield back my time. Well, I thank the gentleman for that expression of concern. I, I share it, and I will work with him and the other members on his side of the aisle, uh, as well as the other members on our side of the aisle, to see what we can do to bring about uh, better cooperation, because we are seeking information that this committee is entitled to have. We have a very distinguished panel. Uh, without objection, uh, all the members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. And we'll turn now to our, our panel. We have a very distinguished panel joining us today, and I will begin by introducing the witnesses. Our first witness is Mr. John Bellinger, a partner at Arnold & Porter, a law firm here in Washington, D.C., where he advises sovereign governments and U.S. and foreign companies on a variety of international law and U.S. national security law issues. Mr. Bellinger is also an adjunct senior fellow in international and national security law at the Council on Foreign Relations, where he directs the program on international justice. He served as the legal advisor for the U.S. Department of State under Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice from April 2005 to January 2009, earning the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award. 
Mr. Ballinger received his bachelor's degree from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University, his JD from Harvard Law, and most recently a master's degree in foreign affairs from the University of Virginia. We are fortunate to have him and his expertise with us today. Our second witness today is Professor Robert Chesney, the Charles I. Francis Professor in Law and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the University of Texas School of Law. Professor Chesney specializes in a broad range of issues regarding U.S. national security law, such as military detention, the role of the judiciary in national security affairs, and terrorism-related prosecutions. He is a non-resident senior fellow of the Brookings Institution, as well as a team member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Previously, he served on President Obama's Detention Policy Task Force. Mr. Chesney earned his bachelor's degree in political science and psychology from Texas Christian University and subsequently graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School. We welcome his experience and expertise. The third member of our witness panel is uh, Mr. Benjamin Witts, a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution and co-director of the Harvard Law School Brookings Project on Law and Security. He is the author of Law and the Long War, The Future of Justice in the Age of Terror, published in June 2008, and the editor of the 2009 Brookings book, Legislating the War on Terror, an Agenda for Reform. Mr. Witts co-founded and is editor-in-chief of the Lawfare blog, a non-ideological discussion of hard national security choices. Between 1997 and 2006, he served as an editorial writer for the Washington Post, specializing in legal affairs. Mr. Witts is also an alumnus of Oberlin College. We thank him for serving as a witness today and look forward to his insight into this complex topic. Our final witness is Mr. Stephen Vladek, a law professor from American University Washington College of Law, teaching courses in constitutional law, federal courts, international criminal law, and national security law, to name just a few. He's also a fellow at the Center for National Security at the Fordham University School of Law in New York City. <coughs> Mr. Vladek has co-authored multiple legal textbooks and has served as a law clerk of appellate judges in both Florida and California. He earned his bachelor's degree in history and mathematics from Amherst College and his JD from Yale, where he served as the executive editor of the Yale Law Journal. We are pleased to have him with us today. We thank all of you for joining us, and Mr. Bellinger, we'll start with you. Each witness has written statements that will be made a part of the record in their entirety. I ask that each witness summarize his or her testimony in five minutes or less. To help you stay within that time, there's a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you will have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals that the witness's five minutes have expired. Mr. Bellinger, welcome. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for coming to this uh, uh, important hearing today. Uh, I dealt, as you heard, with many of the legal issues that are the subject of today's hearing when I served as the legal advisor for the National Security Council in the White House in the first term of the Bush administration, and then I was the legal advisor for the State Department in the second term of the Bush administration. I was in the White House uh, situation room on 9-11 and spent all eight years of my time dealing with many of these same issues. Now, both the Bush and the Obama administrations have concluded that the targeted killing of al-Qaeda leaders is lawful under both U.S. and international law under certain circumstances. Let me start with U.S. law. The President's legal authority derives from the Authorization to Use Military Force Act of September 18, 2001, the AUMF, and also from the U.S. Constitution. The problem is the AUMF is now nearly 12 years old. Uh, and Congress should update it. It does not provide sufficient legislative authority for our military and intelligence personnel to conduct the operations necessary to defend against the terrorist threats that we face a decade after 9-11. And it also contains inadequate protections for those targeted or detained, including U.S. citizens. Of course, in addition to the statutory authority granted by Congress, the President also has broad authority under the Constitution to take necessary actions to defend the United States against terrorist threats. The targeting, targeted killing of American citizens raises additional legal issues because U.S. citizens have certain constitutional rights 
under the fourth and fifth amendments of the constitution even when they are outside the united states but the extent of those rights is not clear no u s court has previously a pint on the issue of what amount of process is due to an american outside the united states before being targeted by his own government now i agree with the principal conclusions of the justice department white paper that reportedly summarizes the laws of political to killing an american citizen who is a senior operational al qaeda leader in particular i agree that an american citizen who is a senior al qaeda leader outside the united states does enjoy constitutional right to due process but i also agree that it is sufficient due process for a senior informed government official to conclude that the individual poses an imminent threat of violence against the united states before targeting the individual with lethal force i do not believe that prior judicial review is currently required or should it be required before the us government uses lethal force against an american citizen who is a senior al qaeda leader outside the united states now relevant to this committee the congress may still want to specify the conditions and certain processes for targeting an american and this committee may want to consider legislation on this issue but these processes should reside inside the executive branch with appropriate notice to congress now both the bush and the obama administrations have also concluded that international law permits the united states to use force through drone strikes or other means to kill al qaeda leaders in other countries in certain circumstances and i want to emphasize that it is important for the united states to follow international legal rules rather than use force arbitrarily the executive branch and congress need to be aware that what is sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander unless the us government specifies clear international rules with which it is complying the us will lack credibility if it criticizes other countries such as russia or china who may use drones to conduct targeted killings with which the us disagrees now other countries including many of our close allies are growing increasingly alarmed by the large number of us drone strikes which reportedly have killed many civilians the us has a strong interest in demonstrating to our allies that its drone strikes are consistent with international law because if allies conclude that drone strikes violate international law or worse are war crimes they're likely to stop sharing targeting information and may cease other forms of counterterrorism cooperation so if the obama administration wants to avoid losing the intelligence support of its allies administration officials need to work harder to explain and defend the legality of this program the speeches given by administration officials have been very valuable but the administration needs to do more to address growing international opposition to its use of drones and the administration needs to be more transparent about who it is targeting and the procedures it applies to ensure that its targets are appropriate and to limit collateral damage to civilians i think the obama administration should be able to release after the fact the names and background information of at least some of the people it is targeted the release of more information should help address the concerns that us targets individuals who do not pose significant threats so in closing i want to commend this committee uh, for holding this hearing and i want to end with a plea for bi or more bipartisanship on counterterrorism issues republicans and democrats will not always agree on the same approach to dealing with terrorism but these issues should not be used to divide the american people we all face a common threat from terrorism and we need to work harder to find bipartisan solutions to these difficult problems thank you mr chairman thank you mr bellinger mr chesney welcome thank you mr chairman and thank you distinguished members of the committee for the opportunity to be here to testify today just pull it close thank you let me come straight to the point. Uh, the Constitution does not require judicial process in the narrow circumstances at issue here today for the reasons Mr. Bellinger just stated and stated in the white paper. However, I believe that a limited and carefully calibrated judicial role would be permissible as a constitutional matter and desirable as a matter of policy. So how might this be the case? You need to bear in mind that there are two very distinct scenarios that arise when the government uses lethal force in a targeted manner. The classic scenario that comes readily to mind for most of us when we talk about armed conflict is that of a soldier 
in the field who encounters a situation that requires an instant judgment as to whether someone's an enemy, whether a shot should be taken. Judicial involvement at that stage would, of course, be grossly impractical, be contrary to tradition. I think that's relatively common ground. But that's not the end of the story. We're speaking this morning exclusively of a situation in which the government is intentionally targeting a specifically identified person. Unlike the classic armed conflict scenario I just described, the scenario actually at issue here is a two-stage process with very different questions at issue and very different exigencies at different points in time. Now, for better or worse, there have been a flood of leaks that give us a, a fair sense of how this process actually unfolds currently. At stage one, the question is whether the available intelligence suffices to establish that the nominated individual is notionally within the scope of the government's asserted targeting authority. If so, that opens the door to the possible use of force later on should that person be located. Stage two arrives only later if and when the target actually is located. Now, at that point, time-sensitive questions do arise as to whether, for example, the person that's being observed is in fact that nominated target, and then whether the circumstances would allow for a particular attack to be lawful and desirable. My point is that stage two is akin to the classic time-sensitive scenario I first described, but stage one is quite different. Indeed, it's no accident that, based on the public reporting of what actually takes place within the Obama administration at stage one, it in many ways resembles a judicial process already. Dossiers of information are assembled, they're put before a group for debate and discussion, multiple parties weigh in and debate what, if anything, the intelligence suffices to prove, and debates take place regarding the notional legal boundaries of the government's targeting authority. The point is, judicial involvement at stage one would be relatively much less intrusive, much less unconventional than it would be at stage two. And while I do not think it's possible to say that the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause clearly requires adoption of a system for review of these stage one issues, and while I rush to add that, of course, there is no current way to get that review, not unless and until Congress acts, I do think that the due process ish interest of the individuals involved, who after all may not actually be senior operational al-Qaeda leaders after all, it suffices to counterbalance the competing Article II concerns that a proposal for judicial review at stage one would otherwise raise or would raise. Now let me clarify precisely what it is I think a judge could properly be asked to do in this so-called stage one review. There are really two elements to this. One task would be to confirm or clarify the law with respect to notionally which U.S. persons could be targeted. This could result in affirmation of the uh, White Paper's position and the Attorney General's prior speech on this subject. Perhaps it would result in a narrower view or a broader view, but a judge could make that determination. Whatever the result of that substantive legal inquiry, the court's core task, of course, would be to determine whether the information that's been put forward to suggest that a particular American is within the scope of that authority actually is sufficient to uh, that task. Now, if the category is defined simply in terms of membership in the enemy force, which is uh, effectively what goes on at the Guantanamo habeas proceedings currently, um, the court would be able to consider that question. It's the sort of question courts have been grappling with in the habeas process for the past four years. If instead the test is something along the lines of the white paper test, it would be more complicated. Certainly the court at that stage could consider the person's organizational links, position in the organization, um, as to imminence, which of course is a central part of the white paper test. If you meant a strict temporal definition of imminence, which is not what the white paper is uh, talking about, that sounds like a stage two determination that can only be decided at a time exigent moment. But of course the white paper describes a form of imminence that is probably better thought of as constant and continuing organizational commitment to attack. That could be assessed at stage one. Feasibility of capture, in contrast, is a stage two issue, not something that judges could appropriately intervene with or review at stage one. Uh, I am out of time, so I'll close simply by quickly noting that there is an objection that comes from a different direction to this proposal, and that would be that the Article III jurisdiction of the courts could not extend to a situation like this, which would be an ex parte proceeding. Uh, it would be a significant issue. It's not obvious that the courts have the power to do this. However, I think that the analogy to the FISA system actually is a good one. I, I know that we'll hear more about this from a moment from my colleague, uh, Mr. Professor Vladek. Suffice to say that in the FISA context, there is very little actual prospect of adversarial testing of the FISA orders that are issued in the end. It rarely happens, and when it does, it's always done on an ex parte basis anyways.
thanks for your patience, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chesney. Uh, Mr. Witts, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the committee, for inviting me to testify on the question of when the United States may lawfully target alleged American terrorists overseas. I want to explain and defend the legal rationale underlying the administration's lethal targeting of a U.S. citizen in the narrow circumstances of a person who is abroad and believed to be a senior operational leader of al-Qaeda or its associated forces. The ability to kill one of its own citizens is one of the most awesome and terrifying powers a people, a people can vest in its government. And the power to do this without judicial check is certainly anomalous in a society that provides for judicial review of countless lesser exertions of government power. Uh, as federal district judge John D. Bates, who presided over the Alalauki case, wrote, how is it that judicial approval is required when the United States decides to target a U.S. citizen overseas for electronic surveillance, but that according to the government, judicial scrutiny is prohibited when the United States decides to target a U.S. citizen overseas for death? Uh, yet there's something equally terrifying, I would suggest more terrifying, about a government unwilling as a consequence of its own legal views to protect its people from ongoing threats of attack from its citizens overseas. In dealing with major al-Qaeda figures overseas who hold American citizenship, therefore, the Obama administration has therefore confronted a slippery slope with not one but two distinct bottoms. Down one side lies a government empowered to do terrible things without sufficient legal justification or oversight. Down the other side, lies a government powerless to confront very real threats to the safety and lives of its citizens, while terrorist figures operate with impunity from sanctuaries in ungoverned spaces. It's not enough to avoid sliding down one of these slippery slopes. U.S. policy must avoid both. With that as background, let's consider for a moment the targeting powers that the Obama administration is not claiming with respect to Americans overseas who affiliate themselves with the enemy. It is not claiming the authority to target any such American citizen, only an American citizen who is a senior operational leader of al-Qaeda or one of its co-belligerent forces. It is not claiming the authority to target even such a senior operational terrorist if his capture is a feasible alternative. It is not claiming the authority to target an American citizen who poses no imminent threat to American lives, and it is not claiming the authority to act without compliance with the laws of war. Given this rather restrictive posture, it is not surprising that there is only one reported case of U.S. forces actively targeting a specific American citizen with lethal force. The administration's view of this matter has four subsidiary components, each of them, in my view, clearly correct. First, the United States is in a state of armed conflict with al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and its associated forces. Second, in this armed conflict, as indeed in any armed conflict, the United States is lawfully entitled to target the enemy with lethal force. Third, there exists no general immunity from targeting for U.S. citizens who sign up to wage war against their own country. And fourth, whatever the Constitution's due process guarantees may require before targeting a U.S. citizen, these requirements are more than satisfied by a rigorous judgment that a person like Anwar Alalauki meets the administration's narrow test for targeting. To understand why this position must be correct, Consider a domestic hostage situation. In such a situation, even law enforcement will use targeted killings, and it will do so without judicial pre-approval when the threat to the lives of the hostages is adequately serious. Nobody takes the position that such actions constitute unlawful extrajudicial killings. I submit that the case that truly meets the, legal, the administration's legal test, like Anwar Alalauki, is not profoundly different from this hostage situation. Now, a mounting chorus of critics has insisted that judici judicial review must be a feature of the legal framework that authorizes the targeting of American nationals. Whatever the merits of proposals to create judicial review mechanisms, and this is an extremely difficult question, one point is very clear. 
Current law simply does not provide for prospective judicial involvement in targeting decisions. It's therefore hard to fault Attorney General Holder for having failed to bring the Anwar Alalauki case for prospective review before a court that does not exist. In summary, the Obama administration has taken a measured and serious position concerning the targeting of Americans overseas, one that reserves the right to target in the most extreme cases, while leaving open the question of the minimum criteria for targeting to be lawful in less dire circumstances. It's a position that is neither radical nor surprising, and it ought not raise concerns that the administration is claiming undue presidential power. Thank you for this opportunity to share my views on this important subject. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Witts. Mr. Vladek, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, it's a pleasure to be back before you again. Um, I, I want to start from where uh, Mr. Wittes left off, which is that I do think, although we might disagree about the actual circumstances, we would all agree that there are some circumstances where the government is allowed to use lethal force even against its own citizens. That's not to say that this is a good thing. It's not to say that it is something we should be happy or proud about, but it is something I think that is an important starting point for this conversation. So in that regard, the question really isn't whether the government has the power to use this kind of force, it's when. Um, and that's why I think so much of the statements you've heard already today, so much of the focus uh, among commentators has been on this judicial review question. Not as a sideshow, not because judicial review is somehow a proxy for the larger conversation, but because the real concern is, are these operations being carried out in a manner that actually passes legal scrutiny? Put another way, how can we be sure, given the pervasive secrecy that surrounds these operations, that the circumstances, the criteria, whatever the law that we believe to exist is, has actually been satisfied in an individual case. And indeed, in this regard, Mr. Chairman, the white paper is curiously silent. It suggests that ex ante judicial review uh, would not be really <coughs> workable for reasons that my friend and colleague, Professor Chesney, has alluded to. And I actually don't disagree that there are concerns that would arise from ex ante review. But what I'd like to do in my remarks today, and what I do in more detail in my written testimony, is explain how Congress could in fact provide a far clearer, far less problematic uh, remedy that would allow these issues, these questions to be resolved by judges by creating a cause of action for damages after the fact. Indeed, to my mind, the only answer to the hard questions raised by targeted killings are for Congress to allow courts to intervene. Not beforehand, but afterwards, just as courts do when our law enforcement officers use lethal force in those exceptional circumstances where they feel compelled to do so. So let me briefly explain how this could work using uh, various examples that this committee is well familiar with uh, to illuminate. First, with regard to creating a cause of action, as this committee knows, when Congress enacted the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978, one of the provisions it included was an express cause of action, even for a secret surveillance program, even where most of these determinations are made behind closed doors and ex parte, Section 1810 of Title 50 provides a cause of action for damages. It provides even for attorney's fees, although I wouldn't get, go, I wouldn't get that excited at that point in the proposal. Um, and so we have this model in FISA for Congress providing retrospective damages even for presumably secret governmental operations. There would still be other potential procedural obstacles that would get in the way. So for example, the state secrets privilege uh, that the Obama administration has followed its predecessors in routinely invoking in these kinds of cases. Uh, but as this committee knows, there have been various proposals floated in Congress in the last four or five years to curtail the state secrets privilege. For example, the State Secrets Protection Act uh, that was proposed in 2009. Whether you follow the model of the State Secrets Protection Act or not, it certainly would be easy for Congress by statute to provide procedures pursuant to which these issues could be resolved while protecting governmental secrecy. One could model those procedures after the Classified Information Procedures Act, which this Congress passed to apply to criminal prosecutions involving classified information. One could also look, Mr. Chairman, to the Guantanamo habeas cases, where the courts have actually fashioned an ad hoc form of the Classified Information Procedures Act to allow for those disputes to be resolved, even with classified evidence. And the model for that is not to allow the individual litigants to always see the evidence, but to have security cleared counsel, uh, who, so far as we know, have to date not disclosed a single item of classified information as part of the Guantanamo hearings. You also have questions about official or sovereign immunity, uh, but Congress in 1988 in the Westfall Act uh, provided a way around that for certain tort claims against the federal government. 
uh, whereby the statute, Congress immunizes federal officers and substitutes the federal government as the defendant any time an operation that falls within the scope of the cause of action is carried out within the scope of that officer's employment. Um, this could certainly be followed here. Now, this begs the harder question. What exactly would courts be reviewing on the merits? And I think, Mr. Mr. Chairman, we could have uh, four or five hearings, at the least, uh, to answer that question. Let me just start from the proposition, though, that this is a question courts are not completely incompetent at handling. In the context of law enforcement operations, courts routinely look backwards after a lethal use of force to decide whether the officer reasonably feared for his life or for the life of third persons. Courts routinely look at the circumstances through hindsight, even though there are concerns about hindsight bias. And so I think if we could reach some consensus, Mr. Chairman, on how to actually resolve these claims on what the law should be going forward, it would not be that hard to empower courts with the benefit of hindsight to entertain these kinds of claims. Now, in his concurrence in the uh, famous decision in the Steel Cedar case, Chief, uh, Justice Frankfurter suggested that the accretion of dangerous power does not come in a day. It does come, however, slowly from the generative force of unchecked disregard of the restrictions that fence in even the most disinterested assertion of authority. It seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that e targeted killing operations by the executive branch present the legislature with two realistic choices. Congress could accept, with minimal scrutiny or oversight, the executive branch's claims that these operations are, in fact, carried out lawfully and with every relevant procedural safeguard to maximize their accuracy and thereby open the door to the unchecked disregard of which Justice Frankfurter warned. Or Congress could require the government to defend these assertions in individual cases before a neutral magistrate invested with the independence guaranteed by the Constitution's salary and tenure protections. So long as the government's interest in secrecy are adequately protected in such proceedings, and so long as these operations really are consistent with the Constitution and laws of the United States, what does the government have to hide? Now, in closing, Mr. Chairman, I just want to make one last point. As Mr. Wood has suggested, there's only been one reported case of an operation that specifically targeted a U.S. citizen. Uh, if the reports are to be believed, there are only three U.S. citizens who have, in fact, been killed in these operations. But if one listens to Senator Graham, uh, who, given his role on the Intelligence Committee, would know, uh, there are as many as 4,700 casualties, 4,700 people who have been killed by American drone strikes. I'm sure many of those strikes were legal. It's possible most of those strikes were legal. But I think it's important to keep in mind that as we talk about drones and accountability for the government, we're not just talking about Anwar al -Awlaki. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Vladek. Thank you all for very good testimony. I'll begin the questioning uh, with you, Mr. Bellinger. The administration's white paper tries to establish that where an American citizen who is a, quote, senior operational leader of, a, of an al-Qaeda uh, or an al-Qaeda leader or an associate force of al-Qaeda poses an imminent threat, the capture is, and capture is not feasible, the U.S. can target and kill him. According to the white paper, imminent threat and the feasibility of capture are not well defined. Do you see any problems with the lack of specifics in these definitions? Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, of course, the white paper is a summary, a 15-page summary of what apparently is a much longer legal opinion, and as you've explained, uh, you know, most members of Congress have not seen the entire legal opinion. Um, you know, I, I, having been a, both an executive branch lawyer and I've also been counsel to a Senate committee, I understand this state of play. I do think the administration, while uh, perhaps not providing the very opinion that was provided to the President, needs to be as forthcoming as possible on these very issues about imminence. I agree with the point in the white paper that imminence uh, cannot mean that a terrorist is about to push the button tomorrow and that's the only time that you can target him. When we are dealing with terrorism, when we're dealing with nuclear weapons programs, there has to be a longer lead time. Uh, the administration has tried to explain that both in the white paper uh, and in Attorney General Holder's speech, uh, but that's a very controversial concept that I think has been troubling both to Americans uh, and uh, for me as a former State Department official, it's been extremely troubling to our allies. Uh, to, well, at what point is the uh, U.S. saying that they're going to target someone if this concept of imminence is really redefined to be a very, very broad concept? So well, let me, let me take it a, a step further. It's not just killing, but it's also other actions taken by the government. The Congress has already required that the military get court approval before targeting an American citizen for surveillance, which right. has a lot less consequences than killing them. 
uh, even in a foreign country. So why shouldn't that requirement extend to a targeted killing? Well, you know, this is, in fact, one of the great ironies at the broad conceptual level. Why is it that to conduct electronic surveillance of an American, uh, the executive branch has to go to a court, but to actually kill an American, they don't? The reason is, about 30 years ago or so, Congress got concerned about electronic surveillance of Americans and said, we want to set very specific parameters before the executive branch does that. Congress could do that in this case. Uh, and I think that's something this committee ought to think about. Now, to a certain extent, I do believe, as you've heard from my colleagues, that this may be a solution in search of a problem. Uh, you know, the United States is not out regularly killing Americans. Uh, that said, even No, but it's good for the Congress to check and make sure that they're not too, right? At, that's right. And so even if only one American has been killed, if Congress on behalf of the American people is concerned about the government targeting people, I think Congress could reasonably pass a statute that says not to require judicial review, because I really think that is too difficult, particularly in a war, in an armed conflict, but to specify the circumstances uh, that the executive branch has to satisfy before they target an American, and then to require some notice and reporting back to Congress. Right. That's the check and balance. Since my time's limited, let me go on to uh, Mr. Chesney and Mr. Witts. Um, First of all, Mr. Chesney, does the white paper provide enough information about why the administration believes it has authority to kill U.S. citizens abroad? And I'm talking, again, I'm not talking about Anwar al -Awlaki. He's, I think the evidence is pretty, pretty solid. He's a bad guy, and he got the, the end he deserved. Uh, I would note, uh, for Mr. Witt's analogy to hostage taking, that you have collateral damage that you've got to pay attention to there. And in this case, his 16-year-old son, also a United States citizen and not a senior operational leader of Al Qaeda, was killed uh, in the same attack. So I'd like you to, to, to tell how we can refine making that distinction and protect the rights of law-abiding U.S. citizens. I'm not saying his son is or is not, but I think that's a legitimate question when we know that he also faced the same demise. So, Mr. Chesney. Mr. Chairman, the, as Mr. Bellinger said, it's quite possible that in some of the documents that the committee has not yet been able to see, and that certainly we haven't seen, uh, that there's a much more expansive explanation as to the foundations uh, of affirmative authority <coughs> to target that the administration is claiming. That said, uh, there is a fair amount of detail, in, even in the white paper, the uh, the core claim, of course, is the, the 2001 authorization for use of military force is pertinent here. Uh, Al-Qaeda membership is woven into the conditions that are specified both in Attorney General Holder's speech and in the white paper. The more interesting question, though, of course, is what about threats that are of similar magnitude, similar threats to American lives that don't necessarily arise with an Al-Qaeda nexus? As Mr. Bellinger pointed out in his opening remarks, uh, a dozen years removed from the 2001 AUMF, the nature of the threat environment uh, the United States faces has evolved considerably, and it's increasingly the case that it is not enough simply to say, well, the threat is Al Qaeda or to gesture in the direction of associated forces. At a certain point, we have to ask whether there's a need for a clear, uh, a clear statement from Congress as to what range of situations the administration ought to be in bringing to bear the armed conflict model. Now that said, the white paper is also careful to identify a distinct head of authority, and that's the Article II authority, indeed the duty of the president to defend the nation when faced with threats to the, um, threats to American lives. All right. It, Let me interrupt you because I do. My time has expired, and I do want to get Mr. Witts with an opportunity to respond to the same question. So I, I just want to respond briefly to your point about the hostage situation. N n number one, you know, uh, collateral. Uh, death is a distinct possibility in a hostage situation and it's one of the you know one of the the, the background principles I think that makes the the analogy so precise is the possibility that you may actually accidentally kill some of the hostages uh, number two I, I think the you know the collateral deaths of US citizens right but that is also a case where the imminence of the danger to those hostages is very very real. C correct. I mean, you, you, you have the possibility of imminent danger to the hostages. You don't necessarily have that with somebody driving around Yemen in an automobile or however this particular drone attack was taking place. Right, but you do have the possibility of imminent death to, 
you know, people in, um, on the airplanes that he's, you know, allegedly putting um, Omar Farouk Abdelmutallab on. Well, look, look, right? I'm not defending Mr. Al-Awlaki in any way, shape, or form. I want to know what we can do to protect U.S. citizens from, from having that occur. Right. Mr. Vladek, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Can, can, I just, can I just respond to that? I mean, I, I think the answer to that has to be rigorous procedures. Now, whether those rigorous procedures, you know, are you want rigorous procedures both on the side of making sure the target is the person who you think he is and making sure that you in fact have identified uh, rigorously the person who in fact is a lawful target. And you also want rigorous procedures that will in fashion consistent with the laws of war, minimize collateral damage. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt because I want him to say a few words and then I wanna to turn to my colleague and I have exceeded my time. Mr. Chairman, very briefly, uh, the only thing I would add to what's already been said by, by my colleagues is I think it's very important, especially for the purposes of this conversation, to keep in mind that we're dealing with different scenarios and different categories of cases. And so the answer to your question, I believe, is going to change depending on whether the justification for the strike is classic self-defense, um, where there is, in fact, a clear imminent threat to U.S. persons or, or U.S. interests. Hostage situation. Hostage situation, or um, a targeted killing operation that takes place not as part of self-defense, but as part of the broader non-international armed conflict between the United States and Al-Qaeda in those parts of the world where there are active combat operations. And, and respectfully, sir, I do believe we're going to have very different answers to, to your question based sure. on which category we're talking about. Uh, I, Chair now uh, recognizes the uh, ranking member of the Constitution Subcommittee and uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for five minutes. I thank the Chairman. Uh, my first question, uh, I must give credit to David Cole in the March 4th issue of The Nation. I'm just going to read the question he posed. Imagine that Russian President Vladimir Putin had used remote controlled drones armed with missiles to kill thousands of quote unquote enemies throughout Asia and Eastern Europe. Imagine further that Putin refused to acknowledge any of the killings and simply asserted in general terms that he had the right to kill anyone he secretly determined was a leader of the Chechen rebels or associated forces, even if they posed no immediate threat of attack on Russia. How would the State Department treat such a practice in its annual reports on human rights compliance? Anyone? Uh, we start with Mr. Bellinger. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Nadler. In fact, as I alluded to in my uh, opening remarks and, and at greater length went into my written remarks, I mean, this is a real problem. Uh, I, I, it could happen this year where the poor State Department spokesman is going to have to stand up after Russia or China has used a drone against a dissident in the next country and the State Department will have to explain why that was a bad drone strike in comparison to the United States that, of course, only conducts good and lawful drone strikes. And so that is extremely important for uh, our government, both Congress but primarily the executive branch, to lay down as precisely clear rules for the use of drones. Let, let me, let me, that, that's yeah. fine, but, but wouldn't, isn't it the case that if Russia or China or someone were doing what Mr. Cole uh, posits, that we would condemn that out of hand? That we wouldn't say, well, you know, this drone strike was okay and that one wasn't? That we'd say... If, if Russia or China uh, were being attacked by a terrorist group that was indisputably posing imminent... Well, the Chechens uh, attacked them at one point. And if uh, Chechens were in another country posing uh, imminent threats to Russia and the country that they were in uh, was unwilling or unable to prevent that threat, uh, I think we would have to acknowledge Russia's right to defend itself. Okay. Let me c continue. First of all, one comment on, Mr. on, on something uh, Mr. Bellinger said. He said, we need due process, but not judicial process. I don't understand, and I'm not asking a question, just saying, I don't understand how a unilateral determination by an executive branch official without any judicial involvement can be considered due process in any form. Let me ask Mr. Wittes the following question. You said, and, and the white paper says, that we can attack uh, uh, senior operational terrorists posing an imminent threat consistent with the laws of war. My question is the following. I don't understand why we need a senior operational terrorist, why he can't be just an ordinary terrorist. I don't understand why he has to be posing an imminent threat. I think the analysis is completely different. Either this person is an enemy combatant or he's not. If he's not an enemy combatant, he's subject to the normal criminal law and we ought to have normal due process and take him to court and so forth. If he's an enemy combatant, 
he doesn't need due process. The question is, how do you determine whether he's an enemy combatant? And who determines whether he's an enemy combatant? Whether he's senior or not, I don't care, frankly, from, from this point of view. But under the laws of war, if he's an enemy combatant, he's a legitimate target. Um, but who can determine that under what standards and what precedents do we have and on what grounds and how can the executive determine that with any, without any kind of other determination? Let me ask Mr. Wittes and Mr. Vladek. Well, I would, I would just say as a, as a matter of law, you've just taken a position that is far more permissive with respect to targeting than the Obama administration's position. No, because uh, I've said it's got to be, you've got to determine properly as an, as an enemy combatant. I, I, I understand. You, 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 you've raised, you, you've, you've raised a, you, you've suggested a narrower process to determine a broader category, right? Um, the Obama administration has taken the view that it generally will not specifically or that it does not assert generally the right to target any U.S. national overseas who may fit in a law of war category of belligerency. It will target people only when they are an imminent threat and a senior operational leader whose capture is unfeasible. So you're taking a view that is uh, a potentially much more permissive and inclusive of, of more possible targets, but, but with, a, with, an, with a concern about a non, the lack of, of, of process on the judicial side. I would just say, I, I mean, I think it is a very legitimate question what processes this body wants to impose for making those determinations. My only point is that there is nothing, there's nothing particularly extreme about the substantive position, there's nothing extreme at all about the substantive position the administration has taken about whom it may target. And under current law, which is the law under which it confronted the Anwar al alawki case, which is real, the case that gave rise to these memos in the first place, um, there is no basis for judicial process at all. There's just there's no there's no forum in which to take these questions. Congressman, all, all I would all I would say is I, I, I share your concerns about the view that due process is not a requirement of judicial process. I was surprised to hear the Attorney General say that last year in his speech at Northwestern. Um, you know, the only thing I think that's worth bearing in mind is due process is not necessarily a requirement of pre-deprivation judicial process. Of what? Of pre-deprivation, right? There, there, in mm -hmm. other words, there are circumstances where the Supreme Court has said the government is allowed to act, and then we will review after the fact whether they acted with sufficient procedural safeguards. And so um, I share your view. I think the, the point is that that's not necessarily the cash out of your view is not that there should be pre-deprivation judicial process, but rather that there is a requirement that at some point some neutral magistrate is require is is reviewing whether the government's uh, um, decision was made with adequate safeguards. Can I just ask Mr. Vladek to comment on the question of um, that I posed um, under the under uh, under laws generally? If someone is not an enemy combatant, y you cannot uh, target him in any way without due process and, and a determination. If he is an enemy combatant. Well, they, there are consequences that flow from that. Uh, how do we determine? I mean, if someone is wearing a uniform at Normandy in 1944, it's pretty safe to assume he's an enemy combatant. But the wrong uniform, that is. But, but um, in the absence of that, how do we determine and under what safeguards should we determine who's an enemy combatant and not? So I, all I'll say briefly, if I may, is, is the, you know, the Article 5 of the Third Geneva Convention creates a requirement that when there is doubt about the status of a belligerent, there's supposed to be a hearing. Um, it doesn't have to be a judicial hearing, it can be an administrative hearing, but there is some requirement that at some point, it doesn't have to be before you capture them, it does not have to be before you act, but that at some point, as soon as is reasonably possible, you are ensuring that in fact, the procedural safeguards that you have implemented have produced the right person. And that's what led to the Supreme Court's Hamdi decision in 2004, saying that indeed, we need more due process, especially where U.S. citizens are concerned. Gentleman's time's expired. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen from New York and the witnesses. I recognize myself for uh, for five minutes, and and I'd make um, the point this as I listen to the testimony here, and we've gone into this decision-making process. I go back and reflect on the Constitution, the Commander in Chief, and even though there's a little political tension over this issue, I don't want to disempower our Commander in Chief from protecting our Americans wherever we might be, and neither do I want to delay his decision. Uh, to act, and uh, so we're confronted with this question, if 
if we are going to review the decision, either we give carte blanche authority to the President of the United States as Commander in Chief to kill an American citizen abroad under the definitions that come out of the executive branch, or we define those conditions here by this Congress, and then we ask for a review. Prospective is, uh, concerns me too much because that delays their response. Retrospective then goes either to Congress or it goes to the judicial branch of government. And so which, that's the question that's before us, the definitions, and, and, the, and I'll say for me, I'll, it's got to be retrospective, not prospective, and I would prefer that we review it here in Congress by some form uh, rather than handing over war fighting to the judicial branch. That's always concerned me. On the other hand, the politicization of it here in this Congress is, that's the balance. So there's the question that's before me, and I would just ask each, each of the witnesses to just go down the line and, and weigh judicial or congressional review. The definitions I don't think we want to try to address today precisely, uh, but what would be your preference, Mr. Vlade? Uh, both. I mean, I don't know why. I, I don't know why you couldn't have both processes operating side by side, where individual victims of, of strikes that they believe are unlawful have recourse to the courts, um, and where this body has its normal oversight function. You know, I, I don't know why they need to be mutually exclusive at all. I think I think it's I think they serve different purposes, and I think they they vindicate different interests. So I'm not sure why it has to be either or. And then, with regard to security. Well, you know, the, I think the Guantanamo habeas cases are a very good example for, for all of us. Um, you know, these are cases where the government's arguments all along were concerns about classified information being disclosed to the public, to the media, et cetera. And even though there have been some five or six dozen habeas cases since the Supreme Court's 2008 Boumediene decision, I'm unfamiliar with any single instance where any item of classified information was disclosed through those proceedings inappropriately. Um, I would agree with that, Mr. Vladek. Mr. Wittes? Um, so I'm uh, sort of in instinctively opposed to prospective judicial review of, of, of these questions. Um, I do think um, the Congress, in the form of the Intelligence Committee, <coughs> and Senator Feinstein has issued a fairly substantial statement about what the Senate Intelligence Committee, at least, has, has done in the way of reviewing these strikes, um, which seems uh, you know, fairly substantial. So I do think some of that is already going on. Uh, in addition, I, I have to say I find um, uh, Professor Vladek's uh, written statement on the attractiveness of, of post hoc review judicially to be a very intriguing document, and I and I am, um, you know, I, I think there's that has a lot to recommend it, and I commend it to the committee, and I also think that Professor Chesney's, uh, who has in his written statement attempted to narrow the categories of prospective review, which as I say, I, I sort of viscerally oppose, um, but narrow it down to its, its finest levels where it would be least intrusive uh, is a model that has a lot to recommend it as well. So I, I mean, I think there's, I, I largely agree with Professor Vladek that there's, there's opportunities in both spheres. But wouldn't it be your, or would it be your opinion that prospective review would delay an operation perhaps I fear very much that it could. I also fear that the temptation on the part of the executive branch when, would be to uh, throw lots of things to whatever judicial tribunal that w was created in order to get you know, cover for things, and you would end up with a very substantial and unanticipated dialogue between whatever tribunal you created and the executive, in much actually the way that FISA has done um, you know, for in, in many ways it, it, uh, attractively in that context, I think in the targeting context it would be less attractive. Mr. Chesney? I certainly agree that congressional oversight should be granular, serious, there should be as much transparency as possible there. I think that's critical. No, and I think that's common ground for almost everybody here. I think the hard question is the role, if any, for the judiciary. As, as Mr. Wittes just said, I, I endeavor in my remarks to show that it, I, I do come down in the remarks in favor of prospective rather than post hoc, but I do so only with respect to a very narrow set of issues, issues that I don't think should be reviewed <coughs> by the judiciary at all post hoc or after the fact, include the issues that are most time sensitive, decisions whether the particular person who's in your sights for this fleeting moment is in fact who you think it is, whether capture is feasible. Those sorts of features I don't think are fit subjects for judicial review. What I do think could be properly reviewed by the judiciary, and, and I think in advance in order to give <coughs> the branch certainty is better, 
would include uh, mainly the, the alleged membership of the individual in the organization in question and their role within the organization. And I say this only on the assumption that we're in a situation where it's not exigent to determine that right now. There has to be an exigent opt-out. Thank you. And Mr. Bellinger? I think I come out where you seem to be coming out uh, in, in the beginning of your comments. I mean, first, I think you really have to decide, is this a problem that is coming up so frequently that Congress needs to <coughs> uh, you know, We've only had one example. That said, it's a very serious example. So if we get over that hurdle, uh, I think Congress could quite reasonably legislate, one, the criteria of who should be targeted, uh, and much of it's in the white paper, but you might put in even more specific criteria, and then the procedures that would be required for targeting inside the executive branch. I would not require either prospective or a retrospective judicial review. I think the check and balance in our constitutional system is for reporting to Congress, if possible, beforehand in a classified setting. You know, there appeared to have been a very long lead time with the targeting of Mr. Alalaki. Uh, the executive branch could have gone and told the intelligence committees we're targeting this person. If Congress says, we completely disagree, we think this guy is just exercising his First Amendment right, the executive should take that into account. Certainly after the fact, if the executive branch has targeted Americans, I see no reason why the executive can't come and report that to Congress. And again, if Congress after the fact says, this is not the authority that we gave to you, we've got real concerns about that. That to me is the check and balance. Last point, remember, it, and as you said, you know, we're talking about an armed conflict situation. And so tying the president's hands one way or another before or after uh, with judicial review of an armed conflict decision as commander in chief, I think is a very serious problem. I would not do that. Thank you, Mr. Bellinger, and your point, prospective if possible and retrospective if necessary as, as, as an alternative. Um, I thank you the witnesses, and I see that my time has expired, and I yield to the true gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Vladek, the uh, determination has to be made that the target is a senior operational leader of al-Qaeda, imminent threat, capture not feasible, uh, consistent with the laws of war. But uh, did I miss it in the uh, white paper where they talk about the standard that's used, whether it's beyond a reasonable doubt or moral certainty or uh, preponderance of the evidence? Or, or there is a standard, not clearly erroneous. Um, where, where's the standard? Uh, if you missed it, Congressman, I missed it as well. I mean, I don't, I don't think the white paper goes out of its way to say what the particular burden is, partially, I think, because the white paper uh, disfavors judicial review, which is where that burden would presumably come into play. Um, what evidence can be, are there any rules of evidence as to what evidence can be considered? I mean, the, there are no, certainly there are no legislatively imposed rules of evidence well, that apply to these cases. Can, can hearsay be um, considered to ascertain whether or not these factors I mean, I, I, all, I, all I'll say is there may well be internal and classified executive branch rules that deal with this. Certainly, we don't know about any of them. Well, we're talking about the rules that we're going to go by. The internal stuff can change every day. Is there any prohibition against hearsay being no. considered? Why is hearsay not considered um, admissible in, in a court of law? Uh, <coughs> I, I mean, I think the, the short answer is <coughs> it's, it's generally believed to be inherently unreliable. And that can be considered to put someone to death? And, uh, best you can determine from the white paper? It, certainly, there's nothing in the white paper that suggests that it couldn't be. Now, judicial review, we've had situations where you got the hostage situation, imminent, ongoing uh, situation. Is there any problem with a j prospective judicial review, if feasible, as there is in FISA and post hoc, if it's not feasible beforehand? So, I mean, I, th I think, Congressman, there, there are two problems, one legal, one practical. Because um, I do think, I mean, I do think you could solve the concerns that, that Congressman King raised through, through an emergency exception. But um, I, I think the, the legal concern is there is an Article Three question about whether there is adversity in the judicial proceeding. Um, the reason why this isn't usually an issue with regard to FISA warrants, like search warrants in criminal cases, as I elaborate in my written testimony, is because those are seen as ancillary to the subsequent criminal proceedings. In this context, without any subsequent proceeding, I think you'd have a very serious problem if the government had this ex parte application to a uh, judge with no one pr representing the other side, either at that point or afterwards. Um, practically, Congressman, my concern is, uh, you know, pr post uh, 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 ex ante judicial review could very well turn into death warrants. 
um, where basically judges have feel enormous pressure in these circumstances um, to sort of defer to the government, especially without adverse uh, counsel, adverse parties, adverse presentation. Um, whereas, you know, in the context of retrospective review, judges have the hindsight, judges can actually see what happened. So I think there's both legal and practical problems that would arise with ex ante review, separate from the emergency situation, which I think you could provide for by statute. Well, how long are people on the, on the, on the list? Uh, we don't know. I mean, certainly, as, as I think the last exchange uh, suggested, that, you know, it, it appears to be the case that Mr. al was was targeted and on a list where he could have been targeted for some extended period of time. So if you're on the list for some, some extended period of time, at some point during that time, someone could have wandered over to a independent <coughs> review. Well, as you know, Congressman, you know, uh, um, Mr. al family did. I mean, there was a lawsuit brought on behalf of Mr. al in the D.C. Federal District Court before the operation that, that ended up terminating his life. Um, you know, that suit was dismissed by, I believe it was Judge Bates, on a series of procedural grounds, uh, that it wasn't justiciable, that the political question doctrine got in the way, et cetera. So there was indeed an attempt to do exactly that. Well, what recourse is there for someone who is on the list by mistake? <sighs> you know, the, at least in, at least in Al-Laki's case, the government I don't know how seriously to take this, but the government certainly suggested that if he wanted to turn himself in, they'd be obliging. Um, and, and, you know, so at least when it is public that the government believes it has the authority to kill a particular person, presumably they could seek to turn themselves in and then contest it, but there's no procedure for that. Is drone killing the only method for killing? No, I mean, I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, this conversation is not actually about drones as such, um, that it's about, you know, uses of any number of uh, sources of military hardware to conduct targeted killings, whether through an unmanned aerial vehicle, a manned bomber, uh, a Tomahawk missile filed, f fired from a Navy ship in the middle of, you know, a body, I mean. Handgun? Sure. Um, you know, I mean, so, so no, it's not about drones per se, although I think the technological utility of drones makes it easier and cheaper for the government to conduct these operations than conventional pre-existing technologies might. Uh, is there any rationale for allowing units is there any rationale for killing them overseas? If, what if they're found in the United States? What happens? Well, at, at least according to the white paper, one of the critical considerations is the feasibility or lack thereof of capture. Um, I have to think that the federal government will never take the position that it is infeasible to capture an individual who is within the territorial United States. Um, but, you know, I still think they could probably, uh, if I back up a second, I think the government could claim the authority in exceptional circumstances to, uh, to use lethal force against the U.S. citizen in the U.S. Law enforcement officers do it all the time. Um, so I, I think with regard to the, the white paper, that circumstance won't arise because you will never satisfy the infeasibility of capture prong. But that doesn't mean that the government wouldn't claim such force in another context. The gentleman's time expired, and the chair will now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I was struck by the chairman of the committee's uh, juxtaposition um, between surveillance and uh, the drone strikes. Uh, and I, I'll have to go ahead and, and, and begin my comments by suggesting that, you know, as we look back not such a, a long time ago when the administration eviscerated uh, the Bush administration for uh, waterboarding certain individuals um, under circumstances that perhaps were at least as compelling as some of the, those we're discussing today. And yet, um, the drone strikes uh, are something that they, they can move forward to. And it just seems to me that there, there's, a, there's, there's more than a subtle difference between waterboarding and, and blowing someone into eternity. Um, and the, uh, the hypocrisy of the administration is profound, in my opinion, on, on this front. With that said, I, I uh, as I've come to expect and anticipate a certain cognitive dissonance and a, and a certain uh, unwillingness to, for this administration to hold themselves constrained to the truth or previous statements or previous positions. So my, my thought today is for those of us that are committed to protecting the Constitution and to protecting the, the constitutional way of life for Americans, that we have to then focus very narrowly on this phrase due process, and that that has to be um, our definitional uh, task 
Uh, certainly there are none of us, I believe, on this committee that would say that uh, we just need to, to do away with due process uh, when we're talking about an American citizen. However, as the other gentleman mentioned earlier with police officers and things of that nature, we have due process in this country, but if there's an imminent threat, and sometimes the degree of the imminence uh, is, is taken into consideration, then uh, the due process exists uh, because of that uh, conditionality. So what I would like to, to do, if I could start with you, Mr. Ballinger, or Mr. Bellinger, just to simply see if we can find some consensus among the panel as to what critical elements should be uh, in any congressional outline of due process here and whether there should be uh, some significant punitive measures uh, uh, built into that kind of guideline to keep an administration within the, the, the track of what uh, uh, befits uh, our constitutional uh, premise. So, Mr. Bellinger. Uh, well, thank you, sir. And I, I can't resist, as someone who spent all eight years in the Bush administration, sometimes receiving the uh, criticisms and slings and arrows from people on the outside uh, to address your point about hypocrisy. Uh, I've, been, I've been supportive of the Obama administration's counterterrorism policies, including of the drone strikes. I would like to have seen some of them, now that they are in office, acknowledge that maybe some of these issues that they claimed uh, we were making huge mistakes on before are actually more difficult uh, than they acknowledge. And that we see little of that acknowledgement. Frankly, one of the reasons I am here today as a Republican official is to give the same kind of bipartisan support to this administration that I would have liked to have seen some of them when we were in office given to us on these difficult counterterrorism issues. That said, with respect to due process, the question of due process, I think, does not mean judicial process. It can mean judicial process in some circumstances, but the Constitution never said judicial process. It says you can't be deprived of life or liberty without due process. So what is the process that is due in a particular situation? In a situation where we have an armed conflict, i.e. a war, uh, the process I think this Congress can s appropriately say is to say that an American can only be killed who fits certain criteria, that it has to be a senior al-Qaeda leader who is planning attacks and that those are imminent attacks uh, and that uh, the executive branch has to have reviewed this and reached uh, high confidence that the person uh, reaches those criteria and where possible has notified Congress in advance if that is possible and certainly afterwards to have notified Congress after the fact. Uh, so I think I, I would guess that at minimum the panelists here would say we could at minimum agree on those criteria if Congress were going to legislate and then the only add on is is there some judicial role or not. Well, thank you, sir, and I, and I appreciate your answers uh, across the board. Mr. Vladek, could I ask you to take a shot at it? Sure. I mean, I think, I, so I, I think we have to be careful, and perhaps I wasn't sufficiently clear in my responses to, to Congressman Nadler, that it's not that due process is by itself a requirement of judicial process. It's that the way to ensure that the government has provided the process that is due is not simply to take the government's word for it. Um, but is to provide some modicum of review, independent external review, that the pro whatever process was due under those circumstances was in fact provided and was not just asserted that it was provided. So to that end, Congressman, I think this court can look to the jurisprudence that the Supreme Court has articulated in these cases, the Hamdi case, for example, um, with regard to what kind of due process is due an American citizen, even one who takes up arms against the United States, uh, in Hamdi's case as part of the Taliban. Um, you know, I think there's a lot that, that we could learn from that example with regard to the balance that we should strike in those circumstances. Um, and I think that, you know, there's, if, if this committee is serious about codifying those standards, there's plenty of precedent to base that on. And would you suggest that there might be any um, punitive elements in those uh, guidelines for a government that fails to follow them? I mean, you know, uh, not just uh, in the case of a prosecutor, sometimes his case collapses if he doesn't do Miranda rights, but uh, shouldn't there be something more punitive than that in, in, a, in a case that has such profound constitutional foundations? Well, you know, Congressman, in my testimony, I suggest that you can provide a damages regime. Um, you know, certainly there would come a point where a government officer might even be breaking various criminal laws if they were acting with, with gross negligence and, you know, intending to cause harm where they don't have the authority to use such force. I, I, my view is that it would be a sufficiently significant step in this context to even provide and create civil remedies. 
um, that, you know, that by itself would, I think, have an incredibly salutary effect on the government's practice. Going further than that, I think, would run into the question of who would prosecute that case. It, would the government really be interested in prosecuting its own officers uh, and its own uh, uh, soldiers? Um, for crossing the line in that case. Certainly, I mean, we do that all the time. Well, certainly it's true in the military context. I mean, so the Uniform Code of Military Justice does provide for court-martialing of our service members when they cross those lines. Thank I think civil remedies might be sufficient for right. senior government officers. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for his good line of questioning, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Puerto Rico, uh, Mr. Pierre Luisi, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I, I thank the witnesses. I have a couple of questions ba based on your um, prior testimony and written submissions. I've noticed that some of you, if not all, have uh, asserted that um, the Obama administration um, is actually taking a very limited targeting authority with respect to American citizens. My first question for each of you then is, do you believe that the Obama administration, consistent with Article Two of the Constitution, could have asserted a broader or far broader targeting authority? If the answer is yes, in what respects? Basically, I'm interested in, in understanding whether you believe the administration has gone to the outer limits of its Article II powers, and if not, in what specific ways it has not. Do, do you want? Yeah, each of you oh, to sorry. comment on this. Uh, I think it's an excellent question. Uh, I think the administration probably has not gone to the outer bounds of what its constitutional powers would be. Of course, none of us know really what those bounds are. There's just not a clear answer to this question. Um, the administration, I think, has taken a very restrictive uh, standard. Uh, the exchange with Mr. Nadler actually gave a particular example. We, instead of saying that the only Americans that could be targeted would be uh, those who are senior a operational al-Qaeda leaders who pose an imminent threat, the administration could, I think, have said under the Constitution that any American who has taken up arms against the United States as part of an on armed conflict uh, could be targeted. Um, you know, if this were a traditional war in World War II and there were a, uh, a German American, uh, you know, we would never have said that the only German American who had taken up arms uh, would be a person who uh, was a senior leader who posed an imminent threat at the time. So I think certainly the president would have broader authority, and to the administration's credit, they, they understand that this is a serious power they're asserting to kill an American, and they've taken, in this case, a, a fairly limited reading. Sir, I agree with that as well. I, I would add that it's noticeable that the administration's formulation in the White Paper and in the Attorney General's speech is, spe is Al Qaeda specific. Uh, doesn't have to be if we're talking about the duties and authorities of the president to defend the nation in a true case of imminent threat. Um, if that threat came from some other extremist group or individual that happened not to have a nexus with Al Qaeda, that power would still be there. I just add to that uh, you framed your question in terms of Article 2, but the administration could actually take a much more robust position under the AUMF itself. And the position would be suggested by the line of questioning that uh, Congressman Nadler. Uh, asked before, uh, you know, the, 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 the D.C. Circuit has said in the habeas context that it is enough to justify targeting, uh, to, to justify detention to be part of or substantially supporting enemy forces. Now, just focus on the part of component of that. You know, to, to follow your line of questioning, the administration could take the view that an American who is part of enemy forces is lawfully targetable under the laws of war and under um, under the AUMF, it does not take that position. Um, it hasn't forsworn that position, to be clear. It said, what it has said is, it's addressed a single, very specific case, which is the case of Anwar al alawki who it found to be a senior Al-Qaeda operational leader, whose capture was not plausible, who posed an imminent threat, and whose targeting would be lawful under the laws of war. And it asked a comprehensive question, which is, is it lawful to target this guy? And they limited their answer to that question, I think rightly and admirably, by the way. They limited their answer to that question so as not to take on bigger questions and more difficult questions than they needed to in that moment. They limited their answer to that question to those three, which are really four, circumstances. Um, 
there is a, that leaves a lot of ancillary questions, like what about the, the non-operational senior leader who poses an imminent threat? What about the operational senior leader who doesn't pose an imminent threat? What about the US, soldier foot, U, US citizen foot soldier? All of those questions are left open by that, and there is no claim of authority to target such people. Would, would the gentleman yield? Yes. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for an additional minute so he can yield to the gentleman. From I, I thank the gentleman. I thank the chairman. I, I just want to clarify, since uh, my comments have been quoted a number of times, that I was not suggesting that we ought to, uh, or that the administration ought to broaden uh, its, its targeting uh, uh, criteria. I was simply suggesting that none of this uh, makes any sense until you have determined that someone is an enemy combatant. And that seems to me that that is the first question that must be determined with some sort of due process or neutral process. Look, there, there, there's, if I may, there are two baskets of questions here. One is the substantive criteria for targeting, and one is the procedural dimensions of how you determine whether somebody is in that substantive criteria or outside it. When you and I had the exchange earlier, um, you described a very broad criteria for targeting and suggested that your anxiety about U.S. targeting practices vis-a-vis -vis citizens was on the procedural side, whether people were or not were not in that narrow basket, or in that in that basket. My argument is that what the administration has done is actually exactly the opposite of that, which is it's defined a very narrow substantive basket and it has no known procedural, or at least no public procedural. So my, my, my point was that however narrow or, or broad the basket, and I'm not suggesting broadening it, you have to answer that question first, are you an enemy combatant and have the procedural due process? I, Time I, of the gentleman. I think, I think all the members of the panel would agree with you about that. I thank you. I thank the chairman. Mr. I, chairman. I thank the gentleman for that clarification. The gentleman from Puerto Rico. May I have just 30 seconds just to confirm one fact? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for 30 Thank seconds. So. Thank you so much. Uh, this is based on Mr. Chesney's uh, comment before. So the Obama administration's formulation requires that there be a link with Al Qaeda just, just before you can do any targeting here. Is that correct? There has the way it is formulated right now. This policy requires a link to Al Qaeda. Is that right? The policy is formulated in a way that is careful to say that it is making an affirmative claim of authority to attack where there is that senior Al Qaeda link. But I don't think it's written in a way that suggests that they're denying they have that authority otherwise. But they do build Al Qaeda or associated forces of Al Qaeda. And of course, the associated forces phrase raises the question, you know, how broad is that? Time of the gentleman has expired. And uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to get back to some basics. and. Uh, I know this may trouble uh, Mr. Nadler, but I probably agree with him uh, on, on much. Uh, I don't want to make you nervous, Mr. Nadler, but uh, uh, in the big scheme of things, uh, when this all came to light, uh, myself and uh, Mr. Gowdy from South Carolina uh, wrote a letter to uh, Eric Holder back in December asking for specific constitutional authority and tracking it to the activities of drone strikes against Americans overseas. We didn't get an answer. We've uh, sent a letter uh, subsequent to that when we got more information on February 8th. We still haven't received an answer from Eric Holder. Uh, and then as the chairman has pointed out, uh, there is no one from the Justice Department here with their battery of lawyers. We hadn't got one that will stand here or sit here and tell us the constitutional authority for killing Americans overseas that fit this criteria. I'd like unanimous consent to introduce both of these letters into the uh, record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, they will be made a part of the record. Uh, my background as a judge, I believe in judicial uh, review. Uh, I, I get troubled by prosecutors who want to do judicial things and then not tell us how they come to certain conclusions. Uh, uh, I don't buy the argument there's not enough time to get some judicial review. 22 years of experience, judges working with law enforcement can move pretty fast under all of the uh, serious uh, uh, examples that you have talked about. So I don't, I don't buy that we have to let prosecutors do judicial review. They work for the 
executive branch. That's just my constitutional perception on uh, that whole issue. Um, so I think the, the points are, as you have said, who fits this criteria and who makes the determination that that person fits the criteria. Senior level executive branch person yet to be named, like a draft choice, uh, that troubles me. Who that going to be? Who is that person? Uh, we, can't, we don't know. It's just a senior level executive person. Uh, I don't think that's the authority of the judicial or the executive branch. And then who makes that determination and then that person is allowed to be on the kill list. Uh, Mr. Chesney, University of Texas, congratulations by the way. Um, two sure. daughters there. Hook them. Um, <laughs> hook them. Um, but uh, l let me ask you this, and you, you made the comment during your testimony that if there is a judicial review, it needs to, good idea maybe to, re to review it when the person's put on the kill list. Uh, I, I'm troubled with the concept that they're put on the kill list, they're killed, and then we're supposed to have a review after that to see if it was lawful? I mean, that doesn't do the dead guy much when we find out, oh, we, we made a mistake here. You know, and don't get me wrong, I don't like these people. I think they need to be, you know, long arm of the law to, ought to deal with them about uh, the crimes against America. But I mean, I'd, I'd ask you to weigh in on this to help us improve this system that we're operating under. Because, you know, as you pointed out, you got to get judicial review to listen to a phone conversation with an American overseas, but you don't need judicial review to kill them overseas. So do you think you need some kind of judicial review at the outset of putting this person on the kill list? Sir, I think it's a good idea, and I think it can be done if done very carefully. And I think the key to doing it carefully is so that it simultaneously addresses both the interest of the citizen and the imperative of protecting the country that, that rests on the president's shoulders is to disaggregate the questions you might ask. And we don't want judges uh, interfering in extremely time-sensitive questions about should we pull the trigger right now in this instance, there's only this much time to do it. But that's not actually the, the fact pattern presented by these specifically identified kill list scenarios. Uh, as we know, uh, as the Al-Alaki case illustrates, there's, there's a considerable period of time and there's, there's a distinction between deciding is the person in the attackable category in general and whether or not some particular attack should be uh, carried out. And there's a role for the judiciary if Congress wants to uh, establish it, and I think they probably should as to the early stage determination, which isn't a time sensitive determination in the same way. You know, we've been talking about one individual. What if, what if the, the individual is not in one of the countries that we all suspect where Al Qaeda is? Because now they are everywhere. What if the individual's in one of our allies' countries? What if they're in France? What if they're in Mexico? What if they're in Canada? Uh, is the discretion with the White House, whoever it is, to uh, get that person on the kill list and all of a sudden they end up in France and we can go after them? Sir, I think there's a, a different set of rules that come into play in that scenario. Right. Um, now, it, it connects up with the administration's rationale. They, they emphasize capture must not be feasible. If you have someone in France, the United States, Mexico, England, any of these places, capture is almost certainly going to be feasible and that, that alone may address it. Uh, I know my time is, is limited. In fact, I'm out, but I, I just like to ask though, is that, discretionary with the executive branch? Is, is that policy or is that written law? I, I don't think, well, the whole problem here with the uncertainty is we don't have clear written law, right? It's, okay. it's uncertain. That said, I, I do think that the feasibility test may well be implicated by the Fifth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment. All right, thank you. May I just add something to that? That's up to the very, chair. very briefly, Mr. Wade. So, I, I mean, I do think when you're talking about potential lethal force operations in, in you know, allied countries or countries other than um, Pakistan, Yemen, Malia, Mali, um, you are talking about a situation where the, the other, cons other legal constraints on U.S. action, particularly sovereignty, come into play. And one of the things that, that, that causes um, those environments that we operate in to be relatively permissive is either the consent of the governments in question to do those operations, which presumably Canada and, and um, France are not going to give, or a finding, and this connects up with the point that Professor Chesney was, was making about the feasibility of capture, 
a, a finding that they are either unable or unwilling to manage the threat that the individual poses, which their law enforcement capacity would make very difficult to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me, if the gentleman will yield, I yield an additional 30 seconds to make the point that we don't want to put ourselves in the position with this analogy drawn by Mr. Witt that we're going to rely on the foreign government to protect the rights of the United States citizen as opposed to our own government protecting those rights. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would now be pleased to yield to the gentleman from California, Ms. Ms. Lofgren, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have just a, a few uh, quick questions. I am, uh, I'll just be frank, troubled um, that the memorandums uh, that uh, allegedly provide the legal basis for this have not been shared. And I'm just sort of wondering, and maybe you can't any of you answer it, but I, if you can, I'd be interested, uh, what conceivable reason there would be for the Obama administration to not share these memos and what the consequences uh, are for not sharing these memos. Anybody who can answer that, I'd like to hear. Actually, it may surprise you as a Republican official, but I will actually take a stab at defending the administration on this, having spent four years as a White House lawyer. Uh, this is the private legal advice that was given to the President of the United States. Uh, and just the way you know, this committee is allowed to uh, rely on Mr. Raymer's advice, and the President could not say, we want to see the advice that Mr. Raymer is giving to you. Uh, to see what advice you are getting. No, would, would, the, would the gentleman yeah. yield on that point? Because well, well, they have shared that advice with other yes. members of Congress, and this is the committee that has oversight well, responsibility. And, and let me just finish the point. It, we're, what we're talking about is not sharing a particular document. The administration, to the extent they have not made clear uh, what their legal analysis is, absolutely they owe you a well, full if, explanation. If I may, I mean, what you can do and what you should do are sometimes different. Right. And it strikes me in this case that this is one of those cases where, you know, if you take a look at the authorization for use of military force, which all of us voted for, for those of us who were here, with there was only one no vote in, in the House, it says the President's authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he dis determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks. Now, are we to believe that everybody on this list was responsible for the 9-11 attack? I mean, is that the rationale? No, you're exactly right. I think you have all four of us agree with you uh, that the uh, 2001 AUMF, which is only about 60 words long, I was involved in drafting it literally almost on the back of an envelope while the uh, World Trade Center was still smoldering, you know, is now very long in the tooth. The good government solution, while extremely difficult and controversial, would be for Congress to work together with the executive branch to revise that AUMF. It's completely unclear about what it covers, who it covers, where it well, covers it. If I, if I may, I think it's not as unclear as you suggest. I mean, there are, this was a limitation and there were big arguments about it. As you're, I'm sure, aware, there was a prior draft that was uh, much more expansive, and it was narrowed so that we could get bipartisan consensus, and it was, it was narrowed for an important reason. And I guess I, you know, yes, the executive has the ability to keep his legal advice um, confidential. That's a longstanding principle, but since it, uh, it looks like at least questions are raised as to whether the executive is complying with the law, that I if he feels he is, I think it would be a very positive thing for the administration to share that legal theory uh, with this committee and, uh, and with the American people, who I think have doubts uh, that are substantial and if it can be cleared up, that would be a good government response, it seems to me. And if it can't be cleared up, then we have another serious type of problem that we have to deal with. I'll agree with you about 99% of the way. To the extent that the administration's legal theory remains unclear to Congress, anybody in Congress, I think administration officials should be up here to explain it either publicly or privately, uh, to put down in writing what they can. 
Uh, I think the questions that you raise are absolutely fair. Is it really clear that uh, 4,000 people who were dead, that every single one of those uh, uh, you know, fell within the AUMF? Or did the president, in some cases, rely on his constitutional powers? These are really legitimate questions. The only thing I would say is that the president of the United States is allowed to receive a particular memo on a particular day and, and rely on that particular Well, I'll just topic. say, and, and I was not a huge fan of the Bush administration, as I think many of my colleagues uh, know, but we actually did get access, this committee did get access to their memorandum laying out their rationale. I thought it was poorly written and misadvised, but at least we were provided with the analysis that they were attempting to rely on, and I would expect no less from the current president. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in a brief but inspiring uh, piece of bipartisanship, I want to express along with my colleagues, my frustration, Mr. Chairman, at the DOJ's absence uh, today. Um, some of my colleagues know I worked there. I have plenty of friends that remain. I respect their work. I understand not responding to a letter from some guy from South Carolina. I don't really understand not responding to Judge Poe's letter. I really don't understand not respecting this committee enough to send someone. Because if they were here, and don't misunderstand me, I appreciate your presence. I'm, I'm grateful that you came, but, but my questions were going to be directed to them. Uh, for this reason, I don't need a DOJ memo to tell me that you can use lethal force to repel an imminent threat. I, I didn't need them to tell me that. Police officers shoot folks all the time. Private citizens shoot folks who are invading their homes all the time. In fact, non-citizens can shoot a United States citizen without having to go to a judge beforehand. Now, there is review afterward, both criminal and civil, but I didn't, I didn't need the Department of Justice, Mr. Chairman, to, to tell me that. I also did not need the Department of Justice in a memo to explain to me that in times of war, you don't need a judge picking your targets for you. And in a time of war, you can't have a judge weighing and balancing whether or not there's too much collateral damage in this building or this village. What I really want to ask the Department of Justice, Mr. Chairman, is this. There are two references in this memo where the target of a lethal operation, a U.S. citizen who may, who may have rights under the Due Process Clause in the Fourth Amendment. That's on page two, Mr. Chairman. And then on page five, the department assumes that the rights afforded by the Fifth Amendment's due process clause, as well as the Fourth Amendment, attached to a U.S. citizen even while he is abroad. So if the Fifth Amendment attaches and the Fourth Amendment attaches, does a U.S. citizen traveling abroad enjoy the full panoply of constitutional protections? And if not, why not? Whichever law professor, I, I would pick the one that gave me a bad grade in con law, but he's not here. So whichever. I, I, I think I can take a crack at why the administration. Does the, do, well, no, I mean, I, here's what I want. Does the Eighth Amendment apply? So, so, so I, think, I, I think the background behind which the memo that this white paper is based on is critical to this question. I, I just, I, and, I, and I appreciate that. I just want to know, does a, does a U.S. citizen enjoy the full panoply of constitutional protections when they're traveling abroad? Because this memo said they may, or we're assuming. Does, do, does the Fourth Amendment apply? Well, so I think, I mean, I, I'll, I'll let an actual professor of constitutional law. No, I don't care. Anybody I, who knows. Does I mean, the fifth, you know, the, do, I have to observe, do I have to abide by Miranda? The, the, Supreme, the, the Supreme Court said in Verdugo or Quidez, it raised it's very serious, it, you know, held that this, the Fourth Amendment does not apply abroad, and there are. To non citizens. To non citizens. 
Um, I'm not are, talking about non-citizens. Right. So, I'm talking about citizens abroad. Right. Do Congressman they or do they not? The short answer is yes. Right. The short answer oh, is so. The Eighth Amendment applies. Yes. Now the and courts, the Fifth Amendment applies. Yes, but courts and the Sixth have, Amendment applies. Courts have said, Congressman, that in that context, the rights may vary in their scope. Okay. Well, he, he, this is where I'm headed. How is the analysis different if it's a U.S. citizen that meets the department's criteria that's in Charleston, South Carolina? instead of somewhere else. So if, I, if you have the same panoply of constitutional protections overseas as here, can you use the imminent threat argument to take out an American citizen on American soil? And if not, why not? Congressman, I think, I think this goes back to a point we were, we were discussing before, which is the relevance of the feasibility of capture piece of this. And so that's the only thing we get to hang our hat on, is the feasibility from some senior level DOJ official who decides whether or not it's feasible or not to capture me. Well, as I suggested, Congressman, I think that feasibility should be reviewable after the fact. But, but that I, I think is of little consolation if you are dead. It's, is, there criminal, that, is there criminal review? If the government wants to bring, if the government wants to indict one of its officers for violating a criminal statute, certainly. It, so you, you think this memo would allow? Well, who would do it? Because that'd be the executive branch, right? Indeed. We have not had much success getting the executive branch to enforce laws against itself. I can just tell you in the two years I've been here, we're, we're over three well, or four I mean, on Congressman, that. certainly, you know, there, there is precedent. If this, if this Congress wanted to revisit, for example, the independent counsel statute, I think we could have a very interesting hearing on that front as well. But Well, I, my, I'm out of time, but Mr. Chairman, I would love at some point for the Department of Justice, if we are not uh, uh, taking too much of their time, to come and explain to us whether this analysis is equally applicable to American citizens on American soil because the feasibility of capture is little consolation to me if that is the only thing protecting us from this operation. Well, I thank the gentleman and I would note that the uh, invitation was extended uh, and it will stand open. The chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch, for five uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Belcher, you said you said earlier in your testimony and then in an exchange with Mr. Nadler, uh, you, you spoke about the need to have clear international rules. Mr. Nadler raised the question of what would, what would happen if, if action were taken uh, by other countries. Uh, and I, I had to excuse myself to attend another meeting. And if you elaborated, I apologize for asking again. But what this, this conversation that we're having about, about constitutional protections and, and how this drone program uh, against Al Qaeda functions uh, under the con our Constitution uh, is is obviously of the most the greatest import to this committee. But the issue that you raise is a very good one. What are those international rules? Who sets them? What what standards would be in place? And uh, and is it? Well, let me let me actually let you elaborate a bit, and then I'll ask a follow up question. No, I'm delighted, really, that you added, asked that question. I mean, we know the Judiciary Committee, of course, is most concerned about the protection of Americans in this mm -hmm. hearing. But you know, as, as has been alluded to, you know, 3,000 to 4,000 of the people who are dead are non-Americans. Mm -hmm. And so in those cases, they don't have constitutional rights. Uh, the rules that would apply to them would be international law. Uh, and both the Bush and the Obama administrations have tried hard to uh, clarify that they are complying with international law. They're not using force in another country uh, in violation of international law, or they are not killing uh, people in, in assassinations or murders. Uh, that said, uh, no other country in the world has come up publicly and said that they actually agree with our position. That's a very unsteady place for the United States to be. I was the general counsel of the State Department. I wanted the United States to appear around the world to be acting in accordance with international law. And the Obama administration has asserted this, um, and I believe that they are. Uh, but we are in a position where most other countries don't agree with us, are beginning to accuse us of violations of international law, and the administration needs to work harder, really, to clarify those rules. What, what are the violations that, who's, who's making those accusations, and, and what are they accusing us of? 
We've got uh, other countries have begun to raise concerns. There are lawsuits now, both in Pakistan and in the UK. There's a lawsuit against the British Foreign Secretary suggesting uh, that the sharing of intelligence information by the British government with the American government uh, may actually constitute war crimes. That's making British intelligence officials nervous. That's being closely watched throughout Europe. Well, but what would those, in order, in order to address these issues going forward, both uh, both because of potential actions that other nations may take that would put, as you described earlier, that will put our State Department spokesman in a, a most difficult situation to have to deplore those uh, while, uh, while standing up for, uh, for the, the drone program that, that we utilize. Uh, what are the standards that will be put in place, though? And, and how, tell me, tell me what that regime looks like and, and and, and where does it come from? These are great questions. I spent uh, four years as legal advisor in thousands of conversations with European allies, some of whom are actually in this room today, representatives of different embassies, listening to the Bush administration try to explain why what it was doing, which appeared to be improper, uh, was actually lawful. And the Obama administration, which never expected to be in the same position of having allies around the world accusing it of illegal activity, frankly needs to go to the same effort now. And the rules would essentially be to say, uh, it's not to start with a treaty. This is too difficult to try to negotiate a 194 country treaty. But to agree on basic legal principles such as a country can use lethal force against a terrorist in another country uh, who is threatening an attack, if that country is unwilling or unable uh, to prevent that threat. In most cases around the world, 190 countries, those countries are able to prevent that threat. They can go arrest the person, their polices work. But in four or five countries, Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan, uh, we want to get countries around the world to acknowledge uh, the United States' or any country's right under international law to use force to kill someone in another country who is posing a threat when it can't be addressed in another way. I think we can get there, but it certainly makes other countries uncomfortable, and they're just not going to agree to our position unless we go out through some aggressive international legal diplomacy. I mean, this is really, it's a great line of questions. And, and there, and, and there um, the, the likely position that we, that, that some would take that that would point to this hearing and, and the debates in this country and say, you're, you're having a hard time, a hard enough time coming to terms with this, pro, this, this idea at the very earliest stages of, of the potential that drones will, will offer. Uh, you're having a hard enough time come to terms with this under your own constitution and now we're going to have a broader discussion internationally and then you're going to, you're going to suggest to us what we should and shouldn't do. Uh, I'm just, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure that, that, con that we're quite at the point where that conversation can take place. It, it's very difficult. Uh, you know, the Bush administration spent a long time trying to explain to people why it was lawful just to detain people without trying them. Most other countries in the world said, wait a minute, you can't hold someone without trying them. That's a basic element of due process. Well, this is actually much more aggressive. The Obama administration isn't just detaining them, they're killing them. And so, uh, we need to work hard to explain, as a country that is committed to the rule of law, why to other countries who look to us for our example, why what we're doing is in fact legal. We can't, it, it's important to have this hearing here, but we need to go around the world and explain why it's legal under international rules. Thanks, I appreciate it, Mr. Belcher. Thank you. Thank I you, thank Mr. the gentleman, good questions, and the time has expired. The uh, gentleman from Florida, Mr. DeSantis, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your testimony. Um, I guess I disagree a little bit with the characterization that this is very limited. I mean, it's limited in a sense, the DOJ analysis, in the sense that they say, all we're saying is that we have sufficient grounds in this instance. But they don't say that they can't go beyond that, and they don't say that, that there's going to be more restrictions otherwise. Um, do you all agree with, with the fact that they base their analysis not simply on the AUMF, but basically said there's Article II authority and Article 51 authority, that if you didn't have the AUMF, President would still have the ability to engage Al-Qaeda leaders overseas? Well, well, I think the, um, 
the administration would always take the position that it has the authority under Article 51 and Article 2 to defend the country against an imminent threat. That, of course, leaves open the question of what the substantive content of an imminent threat is. But to the extent that tomorrow Hezbollah presents an imminent threat, though it's totally outside the AUMF, the administration would certainly assert the authority both as a matter of Article 51 and at a domestic level under Article 2 to counter that with lethal force. And perhaps even if it wasn't an imminent threat, such as the example of Libya, there was no congressional authorization for us to go and, and get engaged in Libya. Um, and so I'm somebody who I really think the AUMF is important because I think that activates the president's war powers. I think when you're dealing with these issues, whether you're going to treat it in a c civil context or a law of war context, the fact that this Congress has authorized that to me means a lot. Um, and so I guess the logic of this analysis, although it only applies to senior Al Qaeda leaders, there's nothing preventing the administration from applying this in other contexts. I mean, you do have to make analyses that can apply to different facts. And so I guess my question, we can just start with Mr. Bellinger. Um, Libya, no AUMF for Libya. We went in. Um, it was an international uh, coalition. My question is, if there was an American citizen who, say, traveled to Algeria, uh, joined the pro Qaddafi army, was somebody who was a major operational leader in bringing arms into Libya that would fight not only the resistance but American forces and our allies. Um, based on how you read the memo, do you think that they would have been justified or do you think this provides justification uh, to engage an American citizen in that instance? Uh, the answer is under the memo, prob probably not, uh, because the under your facts, the person would not be a senior operational Al Qaeda leader that was posing an imminent threat of violence to the United States. Right, but my, what my question is, is they limited to that, but the logic of what they're saying, why is it so important? If the AUMF is not critical, the Al Qaeda versus somebody who's fighting Gaddafi. So I just, is there a logical distinction between those two if you don't think the AUMF is critical? Well, this administration, of course, at least has said that they are relying only on the AUMF. There are a lot of us who wonder 12 years later how it can possibly be that all of this use of force in a lot of different countries around the world against people who may have only been 10 years old in 2001, you know, still falls under the AUMF. Uh, so I think, you know, this is a, it's, it's a good set of questions as to whether this administration would, allow, would rely on the President's constitutional authority uh, to, you know, strike somebody who did not fall in the AUMF. And here's just where I'm reading in the memo. In addition to the authority arising, in addition to the authority arising from the AUMF, the President's use of force against Al Qaeda and associated forces is lawful under other principles of U.S. and international law, including the President's constitutional responsibility to protect the nation, the inherent right of na uh, national self-defense under U.N. Charter Article 31. I obviously agree with that if it's a truly imminent threat. The question is, in a situation like Libya, where it's very much a, um, an intervention of choice, probably didn't propose uh, an imminent threat to the United States. Um, how does this kind of framework apply in that instance with an American citizen? But, I mean, Congressman, even there, I think the question would be, if we, if, so suppose that we had, uh, you know, a, a regiment of fighters stationed at an, at a, at an Air Force base in Libya, um, right? Presumably, if a, an American citizen who goes to Algeria to take up arms uh, on behalf of pro qaddafi forces is then involved in an attack on U.S. military forces who are involved, who are stationed there, then I think we, we wouldn't have to talk, that wouldn't be. Well, no, no, yeah, right, but I agree with that, but not necessarily involved in attacks. Somebody who's across the border in Algeria, who's maybe doing logistics or something. And so that's, and so that's right, I mean, we haven't talked a lot in this hearing about international law, but I think it's relevant, it would be very relevant at that point whether, in fact, what was true in Libya was a non-international armed conflict or even an international armed conflict that would justify the assertion of military force, because I think you'd have both domestic law problems insofar as it was outside the scope of the AUMF or the War Powers Resolution, and very serious international law problems if it was not part of a larger armed conflict. May, may I just add something to that? Um, so I, I think one of, the, one of the oddities of the white paper, and I, I would actually think it's a very ripe area for this committee to follow up with the administration about, is exactly what work the word imminent is doing. Um, it's not clear to me from reading the white paper whether the word imminent is an attempt to, to get over domestic constitutional hurdles, whether it comes from sort of resort to force questions in international law, the way Steve was just referring to, or whether it is uh, an attempt to get around domestic criminal prohibitions against, as a sort of affirmative defense uh, in domestic criminal prohibitions against murder of Americans overseas, or whether it flows from some other 
need. It, it, it's simply there um, as a apparently self-imposed constraint, and it's not exactly clear what, so, what legal problem it's designed to solve. And I think some of the questions that you're asking, the answers to them would, would be different depending on what, what, what work the word imminent is doing. And I, and, and I, I sort of talk about this a little bit in my, in, in, in my written statement, but I think it, it's an area that's very worth, the admin, that worth this committee pushing the administration for some clarification. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is an exceedingly important topic. We do appreciate uh, your being here today. Um, obviously, the Justice Department's folks are busy doing something more important than having oversight. Um, I wish that they didn't need it. All of these issues are deeply troubling, and I like uh, my friend, former Judge Ted Poe, a uh, big believer in due process. We're talking about imminent attack uh, as one of the issues, and we've had a lot of people that have brought up the issue of Al Awaki being killed in Yemen. But I think it's good to, to look what if scenarios before those scenarios actually happen. We know that Al Awaki <clears throat> had led prayers for Muslim congressional staffers here on Capitol Hill. Um, we know that uh, he was probably not done in the United States. Can you foresee a time when someone like Al Awaki is on a hit list, finishes uh, what he was doing in Yemen, and somehow gets back in the United States. If there is concern of imminent attack while he was in Yemen, could there be those same concerns? When would it then be possible for someone on the hit list, as al was, to be hit in the United States proper. So I think the, sir, the al case uh, will be someday the subject of a, a truly wonderful book. Um, it, it's a very complicated and interesting history. Um, I think if Anwar al had made it back to the United States, um, I don't think there is dispute among anybody I've ever spoken to that the proper way to handle him would have been for the FBI to arrest him and for him to be prosecuted in a U.S. federal court. But I, my question was not about what was proper. My question was about the possibility of someone on the hit list being found back in the United States like Alamudi. Uh, he was arrested, Alamudi was arrested in 2002 at Dulles International Airport. He was arrested, as you talk about, uh, but he had been very close to the Clinton administration, had, had worked with the Bush administration, and yet we find out actually he was involved in supporting terrorism internationally. And so he gets arrested, and now he's doing 23 years in prison. I'm asking what could be the prospect that someone get back in the country, and from a political standpoint, their arrest could potentially like al -Awaki. if he started talking about the people he worked with on Capitol Hill, the people that uh, he had met with and worked with, it obviously would be very politically embarrassing. What if you have, hypothetically, someone who has been working closely with a president? We know we had a member of a known terrorist organization meeting in the White House last year, even though Secretary Napolitano, sitting where you are, could not answer that she even knew that was happening when it was in the papers. By the time she gets over to the Senate, she then says, oh, we checked, he was vetted three times. There are things that could end up hypothetically proving so politically embarrassing that if somebody gets back in the United States, uh, someone might look for a way th to see that they never testify. We're talking hypothetically, but I'm wanting to know what are the possibilities that something like that could happen so sir, that's sir, my question. Sir, nothing in the administration's white paper in the Attorney General's speech would suggest that that would be lawful. Um, and I would hope 
that an, any administration, Republican or Democrat, faced with such a situation would um, behave like patriots um, and would proceed according to the law and the Constitution. Um, and I would hope that this committee, in the event that that did not happen, would consider it under its impeachment power. And then when no one from the Justice Department cared to participate, then what? We find them in contempt, and then it goes to the U.S. Attorney and nothing happens, as it just happened last year. Uh, any other comments from anybody else? I mean, this is a real issue because not everybody under political pressure acts like patriots. I can simply say that it's quite clear to me it would be unconstitutional to use lethal force against a person in that scenario precisely because a capture would be feasible. He may, he may still be part of an organization, may still be a senior leader in al-Qaeda, what have you. But and what if your contention is there is imminent attack, it's planned, he helped set this situation up in Yemen, and we need to take him out. Still unconstitutional Not unless Time of the gentleman has expired. Right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Garcia, for five minutes. So real, real quickly, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what steps could the executive branch take uh, to allow appropriate congressional oversight and an informed public debate? And that, that I leave it to, to all of you. Well, we, well, maybe we'll just go down the line here. Um, I mean, one, uh, I think the administration does need to be more open in their legal analysis. I do think it's disappointing that they did not send a witness. We're happy to be the second string here uh, to try to help you out. Uh, but uh, I, as a former uh, uh, government official, think that it does it is incumbent upon this administration to put witnesses forward to explain and answer your question. So that would be thing one. Uh, uh, second, uh, I do think uh, that the executive branch could work with Congress to craft a narrowly tailored law that would specify the circumstances in which an American uh, can be targeted uh, and the notice process to Congress. So I think that would be the main thing that the executive branch could do would be to work with Congress on narrowly tailored uh, legislation that does not tie the hands uh, of the president. I, I, I will go back on the judicial review point uh, that we are all, in all these cases, we're talking about an armed conflict. And I, uh, the gentleman uh, uh, from Texas and South Carolina are no longer here, uh, but we are talking about a situation where the president is dealing with a war, with an armed conflict. And it's really inappropriate to insert judicial review to tie the president's hands in war. No one would ever have suggested uh, that before the president uh, could order an attack against a German-American who was a high-level German leader that one had to go to a judge uh, uh, beforehand or afterhand to allow that German-American's family uh, to come and have a judge perhaps tie the president's hand. Active participation in oversight efforts by this committee and others obviously is critical, and, and I, I echo what's already been said on that point. I think uh, we were asked earlier how much consensus we had on the substantive and procedural issues that are driving all of this. I think it's fairly clear that we have consensus that it would be very useful for Congress to express itself if it was willing to do so as to what the substantive bounds of targeting an American ought to be. Uh, if there's an issue with the eminent standard or the feasibility of capture standard, this, this can be addressed. Uh, I don't think we have consensus as to whether and to what extent a judicial role is either necessary as a constitutional matter or uh, permissible. And I, I think I'm probably the one who's most in favor of a permissible role uh, ex ante. S Steve is most in favor uh, ex post. And, and I think other than that, we have an array of views here. Um, I think one, one thing the administration could do um, and is to talk more and, and more and more about what the internal procedures it's using actually looks like. So starting in with the president's speech at the National Archive in, in uh, 2009 and particularly continuing through Harold Coe's speech at ASIL the following year and in a series of speeches over the next three years really, the administration talked a lot about the underlying legal regime. Um, not at the level of granularity that a lot of people want, and I certainly would encourage them to be more granular on that score. But to me, the biggest um, uh, hole is actually not a legal hole. 
it's a, it's a procedural hole. And it, it goes to the, the, the question that, that Congressman Nadler and I were discussing before, not the substantive content of who you can target. They've been pretty clear about that. It's what, what hurdles do you have to go through before you conclude that somebody is in that basket at all? And on this question, they've said very, very little except to say repeatedly that there are you know, rigorous internal checks. Um, but I would like to see them you know, talk more about what those, what those internal systems look like. Every, almost everything we know about it is a result of press coverage, um, and um, leaks, um, it's time for them to have something substantial to say on the subject. I, I, I don't have much to add to my colleagues other than I, I think that the most interesting omission from the white paper is exactly what Mr. Wittes was suggesting, the, the lack of any sort of detailed explanation of the procedural process. If there are reasons why the specific facts and the intelligence that led us to discover those facts should be kept classified, that's one thing. But I don't know why the, bureau the bureaucratic process that is undertaken by the executive branch in a hypothetical case is, is a matter of national security. And I think you can imagine the, the, the problem is that, you know, we, we, argue, we argue about everything here, right? And so the, the idea that we would put some kind of process forward. And I, I fully understand your point and, and I appreciate it. And as a lawyer, I, I, I think it's necessary. But the, the idea that that process would be put forward to then be analyzed in a vacuum without the exigency of circumstances is, I think, something that, that would, would be a debate that, you know, you're, 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 I understand you're wanting it, but I understand under the present climate, uh, it, it's just almost impossible. I, I, I think there's a lot of merit to that point, and I also think, you know, there's an additional factor which is not about this body, but it's about the FOIA litigation environment that the administration is in. And one of the problems that, you know, with it, with, within, within the bureaucracy people are constantly worried about is the incremental effects on FOIA litigation that every incremental disclosure has. And I think that that's a, you know, a, a, every time you consider saying X, you know that you're going to get a brief filed in the next, you know, the next day that says you've now confirmed X, we want 2X. And I, I think somehow we need, to, we need to figure out whether there's some kind of safe harbor that we could create that doesn't actively discourage the administration from making disclosures, particularly to this body. Well, in the maybe maybe that's what we should be out. working towards. I, I, you know, I, I, I've listened to, you know, Johnson tapes where, you know, the, towards the end of the war, he got into this crazy habit of sitting with his cabinet deciding where the bombs were going to land. Uh, just a, an insane process in, in, when you're engaged in war. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure I don't have to make that point to all of you. Likewise, I, I think you've watched the insane process that we partake of here, where we, we argue how many angels uh, fit on a pinhead. So the, the, maybe, maybe you, you putting forward a, a process that you think would be acceptable. I, I just find that the, if the president would engage in that, I think what he'd be doing is opening up an argument for my friends on the right which would be saying, look at all the due process these, these guys get, right? And then a point from our side, which would say, that's not enough due process. And then, of course, uh, the whole point of this is missed, uh, which is these are enemies of our country. Uh, we hope that when uh, someone is elected from our side or the other side, that, the, that they use this uh, discretion of their office, uh, which in this area tends to be pretty broad in wartime, uh, with all the the merit that we'd expect someone who, who serves in that role. But uh, gentlemen, thank you for, for your thoughtful answers and thank you for your, your, your fighting for these issues. It's important. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the, the balance of my time. Thank you. I thank the gentleman and the chair is pleased to recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, I mean, as we come to you know, sort of this time frame, I think what is interesting is, is I agree with my gentleman from across the aisle. We do argue sometimes about things, angels on the top of a pinhead. But the problem we have here today is we can't argue about anything because justice chose not to show up. They forfeited. They came, they had an opportunity, and instead of engaging in a transparent is within the confines, they chose to take a fast. They chose not to come again. 
it is interesting in your comments earlier about being in the Bush administration over to the uh, Obama administration. It is amazing to me, as, as my grandmother used to tell me a long time ago, don't criticize somebody too hard, you might be in their position one day. It's amazing what has happened now. They're in that position. And I think what has been said here on several occasions really highlights that. We, I believe, and honestly, the administration doesn't want a definition of imminent threat. Because at that point, then they have to actually define what is imminent and when is it going to be applied and, and in what area is it going to be applied. You don't really want a feasibility of capture. I would tend to disagree, although this esteemed panel has said, well, if they were in the United States, that they could always fall back on feasibility and that would exempt them. I'm not so sure that's actually true. Not in our desire and not in our society today. As we look at this, I, I do have the distinct concern is what is and how long this white paper depended on the AUMF. That was basics, it's, it's whole determination. How long can we, de how long do you feel, and it's sort of a short answer here, how long can the, this administration or even follow on administration keep this uh, argument? How long is this going to last, especially when we have shut down the war in Iraq, we're getting ready to move out of, of Afghanistan, and as someone who has served in Iraq and in this area, I'm gonna, just a, in a brief answer, I have another question. How long can they continue to depend on this? Sir, uh, a couple of years ago, my colleague, Mr. Bellinger, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post warning that the AUMF was growing stale. More recently, uh, Mr. Wittes, myself, Professor Jack Goldsmith, and Professor Matt Waxman just this week published a paper arguing that the growing threat of threats beyond the AUMF is making it more and more imperative that Congress look at this issue very seriously. Well, I think the, the question also comes here, and it determination of whether it be, you know, before, you know, you know, before the action is taken to the uh, process of judicial review, if there is one, or a standards review, or opposed, which I have a question about that, which I'll get to in just a second. I think the issue that, that comes to my mind here is we don't really have this review right now. There is that, that veil of secrecy, if you would. They, you know, and, and I would say, you know, from this administration, you know, there is no one denying the Article II privilege. There's no one denying that there is a, the abilities there. However, what we're having a real issue with here, and I think the American people are having a real issue with, is we have the secrecy going on. Explain, at least in the sense, when we're dealing with American lives overseas, and you have a process that you say you have a process on, that's about like me going to my 14-year-old and saying, okay, what's your decision-making process? No problem, Dad, I've got a process. What's your decision-making process? Don't just trust me. This is not what we can take. I do have a question, though, about if we do it after the fact. Of course, I have a problem with the fact that they're dead. You know, that, to me, is sort of, you know, damages, as you put in your paper, never make you whole completely. But my question is, and you brought this up uh, recently, so we wouldn't indict one of our own, and, and my colleague, I believe, uh, Mr. Gowdy from South Carolina, made this, this comment, we're not going to indict one of our own. And if we did, let's just play this out for a second. If we did decide who is at fault, my question for you is, who would be at fault? What we've seen many times is we're going to throw the lowest person under the bus. It's going to be the drone operator. He should have disobeyed. So explain to me, if you can, what is the process? Where would you stop in culpability? And would it stop at the president? I mean, the Congressman, I think it would depend on the decision-making process, which, as you mentioned, we're not, not existent. We're not, or, or, I, I doubt it's non-existent. We're certainly not privy to it. Um, and, and so I, you know, I, I think it would very much depend on who actually was the one who made the decision that had the legal error in it? Who was the one who said, oh, in fact, even though this guy only was at this guest house, that's enough to decide um, that he's a senior operational leader of Al Qaeda. And I think that would be you know, where the, where the buck was up. But if I may just briefly, I think the Congress could write a statute where the damages piece of it wouldn't depend on who was actually at fault. I mean, that's the, the purpose of the Westfall Act. Um, is to say that when a, a federal officer is acting within the scope of his employment, it's the federal government that's at fault writ large. We're not going to point the finger at one guy who is just doing his job. Well, we also know how that plays out in the press as well, and we also know how it will play out in, it, in administration politics on really, frankly, both sides. This is the concerning part, Mr. Chairman. As we come to at least my ending here is, again, I want to state it again, as has been said many times before, but I think it is. The administration today had a chance to do what he, this president has said overall, that he wants to have an open administration which reflects the priorities of his administration and his people. This is not happening. They took a forfeit today. They took a forfeit when they could have easily came, and if they said, no, I can't talk about that, but we can talk about this, or they could get with this committee on a, a, a classified level. There are ways to do this, but simply ignoring a sitting committee and saying we've got other things we want to do, 
Maybe the sun, you know, maybe there's other issues more pressing. But I think for the American people, when they see this, this is a pressing issue. This is something that matters. Because in the end, you made a statement earlier today, Ms. Bellinger, that said, well, this is highlighted because we know we have one instant. Do we really know we have one instant? Because we have not been able to see. That's the concern I have. And, Mr. Chairman, this is why this is important. This is why this uh, committee needs to have the oversight, and it needs to have the administration actually show up to the game. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his very pertinent comments, and I want to thank uh, all the members of this panel uh, for uh, a very good uh, exposition of the issues involved here. Uh, I, along with the uh, gentleman from Georgia, the gentleman from New York, and others are very troubled by the fact that uh, we have not had cooperation from uh, the administration in terms of producing uh, important documents that we need to review to conduct our oversight uh, properly or uh, a witness uh, on behalf of the administration to testify to this. So we will continue to work together in a bipartisan fashion to conduct the oversight that's necessary and to take the next steps that uh, may be necessary. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we probably will have additional questions for uh, each and every one of you. And uh, so in a moment, I'll ask for unanimous consent uh, to allow members to submit written questions uh, to you, and we would hope that you would answer those as promptly as you can. This concludes today's hearing, and uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record, and the hearing is adjourned. Whereabouts? Uh, well, they were uh, from Stanford.